before I get to this service, I want to share two minutes with a young man who recently was in one of my favorite countries in Africa. And he was there doing missions. Sia tuambie kitu. Tulimuombea kienda. Na sasa juamerudi. Bringing in the sheaves. Wacha tuambie kitu. Let's celebrate my young brother, Mr. Stephen. Wow. Praise Jesus, Shiloh. Wow. So happy to be back. So happy to see you, everyone. Oh my goodness. Contain yourself. Anyway, um... I'm just here as uh, Pastor Wangeshi said, just to testify. Um, but first, yeah, did I say thank you? Yeah, thank you um, for your prayers and for your support. All those who are texting, calling, sending that in Pesa, it will come through, baby. Thank you very much. God bless you. Um, I left Kenya, like on the 24th of June. After two months, and uh, we went to Malawi. We were there for three weeks. Also, for those who don't know me, my name is Stephen. I can see the church has grown. Hallelujah to the Lord. And so we were in Malawi for three weeks. Um, we were just evangelizing and doing missions with young people. And just one of the highlights was we got to do a festival. Um, a festival, just a bougie name for like a three-day or a two-day concert, okay? And so we had a festival in a refugee camp in Malawi called Zaleka Refugee Camp, which has roughly like 60,000 people. And the majority of the population there are people from DRC and Burundians, Rwandese, and also guys from Malawi. And... When we got to do the festival, one of the things that we saw was um, it happened that that was the first gospel festival to be held in that area. So the government holds each and every year a secular festival. But in that refugee camp, by the grace of God, we were able to do the first gospel um, festival. Glory to Jesus. And on the first day, we were expecting a lot, which we had a lot of people. But then we got to witness in the two days, 2,000 plus people come to the Lord. And these are young people. These are young people and children just saying, we want Jesus. We want to follow Jesus like you do. We want to preach the gospel like you do. We had a young man called Benito. And he was saying, guys, from today, anyone I meet on the road, I'm preaching the gospel to them. I don't have to be a pastor. I'm preaching the gospel, you know, and we are activating these young people and telling them that you can preach the gospel however you are. You don't have to be on the pulpit. You don't have to look a certain way. You can be in your jeans. You can be wherever you are, however you look like, and preach the gospel. And they're like, what do you mean we can preach the gospel however? And some of them, you can just see them like the tears in their eyes because like God was just also breaking religion, which was in that area. But I'm saying, I'm saying, i church, kwanini, ju pastor ni kubali ni ende church. And I was like, God, thank you because at DCIKZ, we have the grace to be free in the presence of God. And we went to this one clinic. I've never experienced healing firsthand. So we go into this waiting area. We start praying for people. And then this one lady um, who was expectant and had a child. So my friend Iman is praying for this lady. And then because of language barrier, had to elewani. So I was like, are you okay? She's like, pain. Like, oh, pain. And so um, the guy who was translating for us, like, the child, I'm a song, like, he's not in the right position, right, in the womb. And so it, it's hurting and she's in so much pain. And then we just try to, we, we not try, we pray for her. My friend lays hands on her, and then all of a sudden she's like, fire. Like, fire? Like, well, like, good, but like, good. So we're like, God, more, more, more. And then she says, I feel no pain. I feel no pain. And then she picks her child, and they leave. We're like, don't you want to see the doctor first, <laughs> you know? And that whole waiting bay was literally empty. We're like, wait. No, yeah, that is where you clap, guys. Right? <laughs> like, and the doctors are saying, eh, you know, it's like, 
We are literally evacuating that clinic, and we just saw God move in such a mighty way. Lastly, we went to TZ. We were there for... Uh, we were there for two weeks. We had a training for young people, just catalyzing them in preaching the gospel as young people. And one of the highlights that, um, that we saw there is that in one of the crusades that we did, just a pop-up crusade, come up a base to Nakutana, we shall do a pop-up baby, Pastor. Thank you. Um, and we're just praying, and we did like a salvation altar call, and then this drunk man just comes and says, Niombe, niombe. I'm like, okay. So one of our um, team members who is our DJ prays for him and also pulls in one of the host pastors from TZ. And so as they pray for him, he starts manifesting. All right? And so they're like, eh, kimeumana. And so again, one of our team members just hops in. They start praying for this young man. And then he's saying that every single day, like for the last two years, from like six to 12 a.m., 6 p.m. to 12 p.m., he goes to the graves and he eats with the dead. And he's like tormented and he just sees dead bodies. And that's why he drinks because he was drunk. Like, Atoximama ilikuashida. So we're trying to pray for him. Um, Pia again because of Kiswaili to be there. Utajuju Kiswaili until you end at TZ. But blessed be God. And so we're praying for him. And we take him through the salvation prayer. And we just also just trust God to sober him up instantly. And after he confesses Jesus as his savior, all of a sudden, Transacona, oh, the guy who was literally blacking out on us while praying for him is now standing and saying, Guys, I'm driven in a skier. You know. And so many young people we were meeting and they were like, we want to preach the gospel. How do we do that? And just to say to all of us is that, um, ro- sorry, Matthew 28, that's the command that we have. Go ye and make disciples to all nations. The Bible says go. It doesn't say pastors, priests, go. The Bible is written to human beings. You and I are what? Thank you very much. And we're just saying that isn't he worthy of everything? Is he worthy your time in that matatu? Nibako anajua yesu. But we just bless the Lord. Um, and we were like in all over East Africa. We were eight teams. We were in Rwanda, Burundi, um, Ethiopia, Uganda, Kenya as well. And now Malawi. And I think all teams were able to see 10,000 plus people come to the Lord which is so amazing, and be blessed. Pastor, thank you. Namungo wabariki. Come on, let's celebrate, Stephen. Amen. Missions is so addictive. Niko tuwapani, I miss those days. Wow. But here we are, tumeleta missions, DCIKZ. Hallelujah. Angalia jirani mulize, did you know we have a missions Department are the DCIKZ. Anajua. Tebua kupe answer. Kama anajua. Anajua. Okay. And Pastor D will be giving announcements. We have a mission training coming this Saturday, and we want you to be a part of it. And Pastor Dorcas, when she comes on here, she'll give us more details. Bona iswa sifiwe. I want us to get into the word real quick. Um, we've been covering. Christian disciplines, Christian spiritual disciplines. By the grace of God, we want to cover one more discipline today. My name is Wangeshi Mwashigadi. I'm born again. I love the Lord. It's such an honor to be here. It's an honor, an honor, an honor to serve God at the Deliverance Church International Kasarani Zimmerman and a bishop and pastor Ali. Such, such an honor. Isn't it such an honor? Is it an honor to be here? Is it an honor to be part of this wonderful congregation? Amen. And I came to service with my husband. <laughs> Guys, <laughs> you know at our wedding, I'll say this until I think we are 40 years in marriage. Labda your time, say kita kwemisha. But at our wedding, Pastor Ali said, mkituono ukunje, tuki my husband, my wife, my husband, please bear with us. We've never been married again. Sawa, sawa. Imagine. Sindio? 
So I came with my husband. I'll ask him to stand and just wave at the congregation. <laughs> Such extra people, right? Who kiowa? Amo olewe utusumbu evo. Sawa? Amen. And I honor him. I keep saying this and I'll continue to say this. I knew him when we were dating for three years. But now that we are married, I know that he's truly a man of God. So I really, really, really genuinely honor him. He blesses me. Like, he's such a blessing in my life. You're an amazing person, Pastor Babes. <laughs> Okay, okay, into our sermon. Spiritual disciplines. Angalia Jirani Mwambia, spiritual disciplines. Now, we've been talking about different Christian disciplines. And what we've been saying is that the aim of every Christian discipline is to make us to look more like Jesus. Look at your neighbor, tell them. The aim of every discipline is to make us to look more like Jesus. So whether it is prayer, whether it is confession, whether it is fasting, whatever Christian discipline that the church, every believer, is getting onto, the aim is to look more like Jesus. Amen? Amen. We're going to look at the discipline of service. And the title sermon is The Heart of Service. The Heart of Service. And this is the sermon outline. I know time is far much spent. We're going to read a couple of scriptures. Number two, we're going to ask ourselves, what is service? What does it mean to serve? Who should we be serving and why should we serve? We're going to very quickly look at the barriers to true service. What are those things that hinder us from serving God fully? We're going to look at the attitude of a servant. And then finally, we're going to look at the cross of service. Now, a story is told of a monastery that was somewhere deep in the forest. Now, a monastery is a house, quote-unquote, that hosts monks. Do you guys know what monks are? Manajwa monks. I'm so glad I'm preaching in the first service because y'all, mukorada, nyindo ile generation here, you know, whatever will take you to the truth, and we're here to say no. It's not whatever that will take you to the truth. It's Jesus, Okay. There's no one multiple ways to heaven. Ni Yesu. Sawa, sawa. So there's a monastery in the forest and there are these monks who live together. And different travelers who come through that forest go to this monastery and they are, they are at peace. They are having a wonderful time and they receive many, many, many visitors. Over time, however, the monks in the monastery start to quarrel. They start to have offense. And that affects how they serve in the monastery. And so over time, people stop going to this monastery. The people who are adventuring in the forest, they stop going to this monastery. And the leader of the monks asks himself, why? What's happening? Why aren't people coming? The monks are quarreling one to another. What's happening in the monastery? My goodness. And so he seeks advice from one of his oldest friends who happens to be a Jewish rabbi. And the name of the Jewish rabbi is Jeremiah. <clears throat> and so the leader of the monks goes to Jeremiah and he's like, you know what? I don't know what's happening in the monastery. There's so much quarrel. There's so much um, offense when the monks are not serving well. And I don't know how to bring them back together. I don't know how we can ensure that they are serving the way they used to serve. And so Jeremiah tells him, let me think about it and then I'll come and give you an answer. So Jeremiah goes and sits and thinks about it. And over a couple of days, he meets the leader of the monk. And this is what he tells him. He tells him, I had a vision. And in the vision, I realized that there is a Messiah among you. One of your monks is the Messiah. And so the, the leader of the monk is surprised. He's like, hey. At least me na jua si mimi. Messiah, it is not me. He must be one of the monks. And so he comes to the monastery and he tells the monks, guys, among you, one of you is the Messiah. And so over the next couple of days, things change. People start to love one another all over again. People stop being offensive. Why? Because everybody is afraid. Labdan tongelesha mbaya na undi the Messiah. The Messiah. Na umungina na jambia. Mr. Kikongelesha uvi baya kwa sababu ye ndi the Messiah. And so there was peace and adventurers would come yet again. Why? Because all the monks served each other thinking that could be the Messiah and that could be the Messiah. 
I want us to look at the heart of service. And I want us to read a couple of texts. We're going to get into Mark chapter 10 from verse 32 to 45. Mark chapter 10 from verse 32 to 45. I request it in the NLT. Wonderful. And this is what the Bible says. They were now on the way up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking ahead of them. The disciples filled with awe and the people following behind were overwhelmed with fear. Taking the 12 disciples aside, Jesus once more began to describe everything that was about to happen to him. Listen, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him with a whip and kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favor. What is your request? He asked. They replied, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you. One on your right hand and the other on your left. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering? I must be baptized with. Oh yes, they replied, we are able. Then Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup and be baptized with my baptism of suffering. But I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. God has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the ten other disciples, what, when the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. So Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Look at your neighbor, tell them, among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader, other version says whoever wants to be great, among you, you must be your servant. Look at your neighbor, tell them, you must be a servant. Verse 44. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. Look at your neighbor, tell them, must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. And that is the word of God. Amen. Hey, tungekua kwingine, tungesema praise be unto God. Sema tu, amen. Aya. I want us to run to Philippians chapter 2 from verse 1 to 8. Philippians chapter 2 from verse 1 to 8. Media team, if you have it in the English Standard Version, that would be nice, but no pressure. Mkonayo, kwa ESV. Okay. Sawa. No pressure. We can do it in NKJV. Umefika Philippians? Wewe mwenye unaniangali umefika Philippians? <laughs> We're going to read from verse 1 to 8. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition. Actually, from verse 3 to 8, Nisisi tutasoma pamodra. I want to three, go. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Again, let each of you, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Verse 5. Uh 
And that is the word of God. Say many to amen. And that is the word of God. <laughs> there is one last text, but it a kuwa homework. So I want you to write it. We will not read it. I want you to write John chapter 13 from verse 3 to 14. And this is the story of Jesus. Just before he was taken up to go and be crucified, he washed the disciples' feet. I want you to go and read it, and I want you to read it with a new set of eyes in Jesus' name. Amen? So just like I said in the outline, we want to look at what is service. And service, best described in its simplest form, is an act of helping or doing something for someone, okay? Service is an act of helping or doing something for someone. That person might need it or not, okay? For example, when my husband, my gracious, nice, kind husband, irons my clothes, I can iron clothes, but I don't like to iron clothes. Yet he does it better and he enjoys it. So once in a while, I'll just carry my top and then I'll go and say, please, please. <laughs> and many times he will serve me, okay? Does it mean I cannot do it? I can, right? But he helps. That is service. When you do an act of helping something, somebody or doing something for somebody, sometimes they need it, sometimes they really don't need it. That is service. So what is service to a believer? Service primarily looks like us going out of our way to serve, number one, God. Service is unto God always for a believer. Service is unto God always for a believer. Before I serve my neighbor, before I do anything for anyone else, it is unto God first. Because all creation was meant to do what? To glorify God. And so as a believer, everything that you do is centered around Jesus. Look at your neighbor, tell them, as a believer, everything you do is centered by God. So it is by God, for God. Look at your neighbor, tell them, by God, for God. And so, this service that is primarily about God then trickles down to my neighbor. Jesus would say to the disciples, if you are not able to love the neighbor that you can see, how are you able to love God that you're not able to see? And I would say very similarly about service. If you're not able to serve the neighbor that you can see, how then are you able to serve God who you cannot see? Amen? So the believer's mandate primarily is in two. To serve the Lord your God with all your heart and to serve people. Look at your neighbor, tell your neighbor, serve the Lord with all your heart. And then serve people. So why do we serve? Primarily, we serve the Lord because we love him. Service, at the center of service, is a love for God. And why do we love God? We love the Lord because he first loved us. Paul would say in the book of Romans that while we were still sinners, what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? Bible study, Bible study. <coughs> he loved us first. And so we love God primarily because he first loved us. And he proves his love by coming to die for us in the person of Jesus Christ. And so that is why when we go out to evangelize, and one of the trick questions every time you meet somebody who is Muslim, They'll tell you, we don't have a problem with Jesus. Jesus is he's a good guy. But the problem we have with you Christians is that you esteem Jesus to be God. But to us, according to the Quran, he is he's a prophet. He's a nice guy. Isa is a good guy. He's a prophet. esteem. But we believers know that that is not true. That Jesus is God. We talk about the triune God. God the Father. God the Son. God the Spirit. And so when Jesus came in the form 
of man to die for us, primarily it was God taking the person that is Jesus Christ himself and dying for us on the cross. So it was God sending out God to die for us and he did not leave us alone. Remember the third guy in the, in the Trinity? Do you remember the third guy who is very important? What is his name? The Holy Spirit who is not an it. He is a person who has feelings and is grieved and can be joyful. And so primarily it was God sending God to die for us and then he sent God to live in you. Amen? And so why do we serve? We serve because he first loved us and he showed his love. He proved his love because love is a doing word. Look at your neighbor, tell them love is a doing word. Because when you love, you will do something. It was not enough for God to die, to just love us from heaven and remain there. He did something. He did something. And so love does. Look at your neighbor, tell them, say, love does. So he died for us. He saved us and he went to heaven to make a place for us and he sent himself in the person of the Holy Spirit to live inside of us. And while, while we are here on earth, he continues to sanctify us and when the journey is over, he will come to get us. What a God. So we serve ultimately to God. And then we serve the people that are made in the image and likeness of God. That truly at the center of service is God. Look at your neighbor, tell them you are an image bearer. And you bear the image and the likeness of God. So when you serve your neighbor, you are serving God. God. Ultimately, our service is centered with God, by God, for God. So that while you are serving your neighbor, you will not grumble because you're doing it as unto God. No wonder Paul again would remind us in the book of Colossians that whatever you do, do it as unto God, not as unto man. Because God is able to see the intentions of our heart. Praise God. God is able to see the intentions of our heart. I want us to very quickly look at some of the barriers to service. What are those things that hinder us from truly serving God? We've just read Mark chapter 10 from, that, from verse 32 to 45. And it's such an interesting story. Jesus has just come from explaining to the disciples what is about to happen to him. He's talking about how he will be crucified, how he will be flagged and he will be beat up for their sake. And these guys are thinking about heaven and the honor that will come to them. Like, me ni mekuja kukwambia, guys, in a few days I'm about to die. It's going to be brutal. It's going to be tough. And... Guys, I'm doing it because I love you guys. And these guys are like, okay, fine, that's great. So, to kifika heaven, mine is on your right hand, no mwingine aka on your left hand. The first barrier to us really seeing service is selfish ambition. Look at what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. He says, I'm going to read from verse 2. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition. The key barrier to us not serving God is selfish ambition. We are thinking, I want control. I want to be seen as a leader. I want it to be all about me, 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 and me cannot be in the same place with service because it stops becoming about God. It becomes about building my own empire. And the kingdom of God is not, it's not about building personal empires. No wonder Paul would describe the body of Christ like your own body. 
There is no day that your hand wakes up and says, so it's all about me, 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 me. Where brain keti chini, migu keti chini, ni mimi mkono ni narani isho. What happens? Is the hand able to walk? Is the hand able to see? Is the hand able to hear? But the body works in such a beautiful way. The ear knows what to do. They don't wake up in the morning and they have a meeting. They're like, okay, guys, we've assembled you here for a conference. Ears, are you ready for the day? Great. Eyes, are you in check? Hands, are you good? Feet, are we okay? Let's do this. They work together for your good so that you can work. And so Paul is describing the body of Jesus Christ like your body. That every part of the body is important. Every part of the body serving each other builds the kingdom of God. But when the eyes decides to pursue selfish ambition, what happens? So why is it different in the body of Christ? That sometimes we find in ourselves we want to build personal empires while still building this kingdom. The two cannot go together, my dear brothers and sisters. Paul is saying, put away selfish ambition. Put away conceit. Have the mind that was in Christ. That Christ, though he was God, he did not find it a place of trying to equal himself with God, but rather he used the opportunity to come and give himself for you and I as a ransom. So we serve because we have seen the image of Christ Jesus, our Savior, serving. I want you to look at your neighbor tell them, if Jesus could serve, you can serve too. If Jesus could serve, look at your neighbor tell them, if Jesus could serve, you should serve. Number two, time is really running. Guys, guys, you're my friends. Number two, one of the barriers to true service is conceit, what Paul describes as conceit. And, and simply put, conceit is pride. Pride. Pride is in the way of us truly, fully serving the Lord in a genuine place. Pride is a barrier as we look at the heart of service. When you look at some of the things, for example, we do in church and you think, ah, yet without these ushers, you would sit however, wherever, whenever, and that would not be orderly even as we come as the body of Christ to fellowship. That every part of the body matters. When you look at your neighbor and you think, mini savuyo, anajua mini nani, doctor, professor. Why would I take time to serve my neighbor? Look at your neighbor, tell them pride, pride. Is, a is a key barrier to true service. If Jesus could become man. Do you know how downgrading that is? This is commander of angels in heaven. Immortal being wearing this body that is mortal, that gets sick. This body that gets tired, that gets fatigued. To die for me and you, I mean. I mean. I want you to look up at your neighbor tell them, if Jesus could serve, you can serve. And you should. Number three, very quickly. Media team, but don't box. Number three is competition. Competition will be in the way of us fully serving the way God wants us to serve. If you wake up one day and you decide you want to serve the body of Christ because somebody that you don't like is serving, go home. Uskudre, uskam, katu home. The body does not compete part with part. There is no day the leg is trying to outdo the eyes or the hands are trying to outdo the mind. They work together so that you can do your life 
the way you do it. It should be the same for the body of Christ. The desire of God is that we are reunited, working one another to complement one another, not to compete with one another. And until this has fully sunk in us, we are not building the kingdom of God. We are building our own empires. Paul is saying, have one mind, the mind that was in Christ Jesus. Have the same love that is being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own, own interests, but also to the interests of others. We are not competing. Believers, you're not competing with your neighbor. You're serving them because God loved you and now you have an opportunity to love God and one of the ways that we show that we love God is by serving him. We're not competing one to another. We're not running to see nani atapelekea Pastor Brian maji wa kwanza. Si bora amekunywa maji. It's the same in the kingdom of God. It's not one team against the other team or another department against another department. The point is to serve. Why? Because he first loved me. And so I get an opportunity to love him with my service. That is the foundation of serving. That because he loved me so greatly, I get to love him. I have an opportunity to love him. And how I will love him is by serving him. Number four, one of the barriers is looking down on others. Listen to what Paul is telling the church in Philippi. Mind you, I should say this. This was a church that he was happy with. As he's giving this instruction to the church of Philippi, this is one of Paul's happiest books. And so it's not a threat. This is not Galatians. Galatians chapter, is it three that talks of, oh, you foolish Galatians? This church, he's happy with this church. He's trying to tell this church, keep on. And so as we think of this discipline, it's not because we are unhappy with you. and You're know, someone who is targeted. How are you happy in service Paul is writing to a church that he's happy with. So he's trying to encourage them that their service, they would remember that their service is first unto who? Listen to what he's saying. He's saying, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. Because what will service do to you? It will foster humility. It will foster humility in us. It is impossible to serve somebody and still think that they are insignificant and you are more. Look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 12 verse 3. He talks about let everybody have so bad judgment as they think of themselves. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. How do you perceive yourself? Because if you perceive yourself to be so great, then it is impossible for you to serve in a way that is genuine. If you think that you're the it man, it will be impossible to take on the place of humility and serve. Because humility and service cannot go to... Humility, pride, and service cannot go together. But humility and service go hand in hand. This is what the Lord is saying. That I ought to look at the other person more significantly than I, then I will be able to serve them. Some of us, the reason we are unable to serve is because we think we are too big, we are too good, we are too great. But let me remind you, brothers and sisters, apart from the Lord, you are 
like filthy rags. And your service in front of him is like filthy rags. The loose, genuine meaning of the filthy rags that the Bible talks about is pads, used pads. That's the original meaning of the filthy rag that is being described over and over again in scripture. That my service, me on a good day, minus God, is like a used pad. And I want us to think and ask ourselves, what have we been presenting before God? Is it filthy rags? Is God happy with my service? Is it genuinely unto him or unto man so that I am seen? Selfish ambition or so that I can get ahead, so that I can get a reward. Why have I been serving? Finally, as we look at the barriers, because time is running after me and it shall not catch me in Jesus' name. The last barrier is offense. Look at your neighbor, tell them offense. Some of our service is so haphazard because we are so offended. And so if I'm offended with Brian in the house, what do I do? He sleeps hungry. Sindio, is that godly? Our service sometimes is haphazard because we are so offended. But let me remind you, before you serve anybody, remember it is unto God. And we need to deal with our offense so that we can serve God from a place of humility and genuineness of heart. Because you know what happens when you serve, when you're offended? Everything that that person does is wrong. When you're little, you're a little bit English. When you're a little English, in fact, you're a little bit English. What's your position? What's your position? head of ushering? What's your head of protocol? Akona qualifications gani ndio akue protocol. In fact, I have served in the team for the president. Why am I not the head? Because we are offended. And God wants us to deal with our offense. Because offense will not allow us to serve people genuinely. It will not allow us to serve God genuinely. We will be building our empires when the Lord has called us to build his empire. Deal with your offense. Deal with your offense. Deal with your offense. So that you can serve God in a genuine place. This story has been given 1,000 times. But allow me to give it because I joined this family. Saru likes to say. You remember that story in Matthew that talks about, oh, you know, when many will come to him saying, Lord, we cast out demons in your name. We did dangasidri what in your name. And what does the Lord say? He says, Go away from me, you workers of iniquity. And Saru likes to say, and then. Sasa, mungu wa kikukata, and then. You know, it's one thing if the world is saying, we are done with you. You'll run in the hands of God. Sasa, God wa kikukata, and then. And then. <laughs> I dare ask us, if our service is not unto God, when we give an account eventually, and then. When God is saying, okay, you planted schools in Malawi. <laughs> See, targeted, by the way. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> or you did these things and you went for missions and you lifted the name of Jesus. And then Jesus is saying, Miss Kujui, where we work of iniquity. I believe part of it is if we are so offended that we miss Jesus while serving. Because it is possible for you to miss the Lord while you serve him. Because of pride, because of selfish ambition, because of selfish interest, because of offense. It is possible to wake up so early in the morning to come here and serve of the, peop the people of God and then miss him. And that is scary because the question is, and then, what was it for? What was it for? So what should embody the attitude of a servant? 
very quickly. I will rush through it. What should embody the heart of a servant? Number one is humility. Humility. Look at what Paul says from verse 5. He says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though was in the form of God, did not count it equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. One of the key markers of a servant is humility. Humility, 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 that I think not of anyone to be lesser than me, but I perceive myself soberly as I ought, and I perceive everyone else better than I. Number two is obedience as unto God. Simple obedience. That's another marker of, an, of a servant. It will mark you. Simple obedience. Because it's one thing to serve. Now there's another category of people who fully, completely do not serve. You do not serve the body of Christ. You do not serve people. You do not serve anywhere. You do not serve in the church. You do not serve in your family. Wewe uko tu. Yet service is unto God and it requires simple obedience. When you think about the one commission that all believers have been given, requires service. And, and Stephen alluded to it. He says in the book of Matthew, when Jesus is about to leave, this is the last words of Jesus, just before he ascends. What does he say? Therefore, go ye. Going is service. Go ye. Where? To the ends of the earth. Doing what? Proclaiming what I have been teaching you. Proclaiming the gospel. And then do what? To the new converts. Baptize them. That service. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The going is service. So evangelism is part of it. The sharing the gospel is service. The baptizing is service. The discipling is service. Such that every part of the body is working towards one thing. That we will make sure hell is depopulated. And the kingdom of God is built. Build my church. Don't build your empire. Don't build your kingdom. Don't build your house. Build my church. Simple obedience. You cannot know the Lord, love the Lord, and remain to be a Sunday believer. Serve. Build his church. Build his church. It is his church. It's not Bishop Mark's church. It's his church. It's not Bishop's church. It's his church. Build his church. Finally, I'm going to talk about these three very quickly. One of the attitude markers of a servant is love. 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 Please put up Romans 12, 9. Romans 12, 9. Love. Let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Paul is talking and he's saying, our love should be genuine. It's not Christianist love. It's not, hi, Sister Grace. Kosalama, oh gosh, me na kupenda, like I'll just love you, the blood of, like just, I love you, I love you, I love you. Two seconds later, me dim. First of all, her dressing is a problem. Genuine love that is not covered with hypocrisy. That's what God is calling us unto. Because when you love the Lord and you love your neighbor, you will serve them. And so one of the reasons why we don't serve is because we don't genuinely love people. 
Yet it is commanded by Jesus Christ himself to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Why would Jesus call us to, to love our neighbors? Because they are image bearers. They carry the image and the likeness of God. And it starts in Genesis. Of all creation that God made, there was only one that he took time to actively make. He says now, let us make man in our own image and likeness. So when I love my neighbor and serve my neighbor, I'm serving and loving an image bearer. Somebody who carries the image of God. So essentially, I am loving God and serving God. Number two, an attitude of a marker of a servant should be courage. Biblical courage. Christ-like courage. Christ-like boldness. It takes courage to look at your neighbor in the matatu and because you're genuinely thinking, if they go to hell and I had an opportunity to speak to them, what would my life become? You turn to them and you say, hi, my name is Wangeshi and I'm born again and, and, and how are you? It takes courage. It takes courage when we are doing prayer walks for you to come and say, so that Zimmerman is changed, so that Kasarani is changed, I have a part to play. I will serve my community by going around and declaring words of life. It takes courage. It takes courage to go to a crusade and tell people, do you know the Lord? It takes courage. And that kind of courage can only be given by God. It takes courage for you to dress up and come and tell people, naomba usiketi hapa, keti hapa. But there are people that I genuinely appreciate is the ushers and the protocol team. Kwambia mtu usipaka hapa. Anakwambia gari ni ya nani? Ni yangu ama ni yako? Ama anakwambia fungua boot nione what is inside. It takes courage for somebody to come and tell you, open your car, I want to check inside. But it is for your own safety. True or true? So serve these people by making their work easy. Ukembus pak apa, pak pale, sure. I promise it's not a liter of fuel that will help you to move here to here. Serve them by making their work easier so that they can serve you without offense. Some of us were the reason these people are so offended. And you're making their service not genuine because you keep offending them. Don't be a hindrance to their service. It takes zeal and fervence. And fervent zeal is ideally passion. Are you passionate about what you do? Are you serving out of passion because you love the Lord? He talks about it in Romans chapter 12, verse 11. He's saying, don't be slothful. Because some of us, you serve, but tunajuliza, ungeka home, ingekua better. Kwa sababu, not lagging in diligence, but be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Not lagging in diligence, the English Standard Version talks about slothfulness. But be zealous in your service. Unto who? What is the Bible saying? Unto who? Unto the Lord. Look at your neighbor. Tell them, can you have some passion in you? <laughs> Hallelujah. Finally, 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 brethren. What is the cross of serving? What is the cross? Because there is a cross. There is a cross. And Jesus alludes to it as he's speaking to James and John. He asks them, are you able to share in my cup, the cup of suffering? Are you able to truly be baptized? The baptism I am about to go through. And this foolish brethren says, <laughs> if they knew what was ahead, I don't know wangekua natamaya kusema yes haraka because James is the first one of the disciples to die. He, does a, he dies a gruesome death. John, the teachings say that he died naturally, but he escaped, 
hilarious things, including being put in boiling oil. And primarily, the, the cross of serving is that as you serve anonymously, maybe nobody will ever get to know what you do. Maybe you're not in a department that is out there. Maybe you're behind the scenes, behind a computer, behind a camera. Nobody will ever get to see what you do. And the question is, will I serve with no reward? Will I serve even though my name will never be known? It will never be written in history books. There lived a lady who served the Lord diligently in such a place. Will I serve? Will I serve if Bishop doesn't know that I'm serving? Will I serve if there will be no accolades and praises that will follow me? Will I serve if I am crucified for it or persecuted for it? If I go out and tell others about Jesus and their reply to me is, our to aspire, first of all, it's in a time. Will I serve? Will I serve if people think, look at me and think I'm crazy? Why would you give your life to Jesus? And that is truly the cross of service. Will I serve like my master, sharing in his suffering? Will I serve as my master, who was crucified, betrayed, and hurt? Will I serve anonymously? Will I serve with no accolades or no reward? Will I serve remembering is that it's, it's unto the Lord that it is more blessed to serve than to be served. Will I serve? I want you to close your eyes and think about your service and to commit it before God. This is one of the sermons that they cut the other person, but they also cut me deeply. I want you to take a minute and ask yourself hard questions. Your service is unto who? And are you willing to bear the cross of service? Are you willing to bear the cross of service? Are you willing to serve him and to love him who called you? And I want you to take a minute and just dedicate your service to God. And if you've not started to serve him, commit to serving him. Because we serve him because we love him. And we love him because he loved us first. I will serve you because I love you. that you'd forgive us for every time that we served you out of offense, that we served you out of competition, that we served you out of selfish ambition and selfish interest, that we served you building our own empires, oh God. We ask that you'd wash us and cleanse us and forgive us, oh God. Because it is not about us, it's about you, your kingdom 
your kingdom on earth. Your kingdom being built, your kingdom being seen, it's about you. And so forgive us when our hearts were not right. That when we served you, we served complaining. We served blind to who it is that we are serving. We get to serve the King of Kings. We that were nothing when you found us. We get to have an audience in your presence. We get to serve the master of the universe. We get to serve you. It's a divine opportunity. We get to serve the one who died for us. We get to serve you. So set our hearts right, oh God. Set our hearts right. Set our hearts right. Where there is offense, master, penetrate our hearts and clean it off. Where there is competition, Lord, pour your humility upon us. Where there is selfish ambition and interest, fill us with your love because we get to serve you. And we get to serve your people. So set our hearts right. Set our eyes right. Set our attitude right because we get to serve you. It is an honor. It is a privilege to serve the master of the universe. Set us right. Some of us are struggling to serve you. We are struggling with simple obedience. Set our hearts right. Some of us have been serving, but we are in genuine. Set our hearts right. Some of us are serving offended. Set our hearts right. That when it is all said and done, my master, from you we will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. That's the desire of our heart. That we will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Set our hearts right. Set our hearts right. Set our hearts right, Jesus. Set our hearts right. Set my heart right. Set my heart right, oh God. Set my heart right. In Jesus' name.